Hello, and welcome to Partially Redacted, a podcast where we discuss privacy and security engineering and related topics. I'm your host, Sean Falconer, and today I'm joined by Aaron Painter, CEO of Nametag, and we'll be talking about countering AI deepfakes with identity data. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for, for coming in online and, and, and doing this. I'm really excited about the topic. I think it's super interesting. But before we get too deep, um, you know, let's share a little bit about yourself. Uh, who are you? What do you do? Yeah, I'm the CEO of Nametag. Uh, we're a company founded about four years ago, focused on more a secure way to do identity verification uh, as a tool to prevent fraud, uh, kind of stop deep fakes. And we center a lot in on kind of what we call high risk moments. And one of the most high risk moments happens to be when a user is sort of locked out of their account and needing to reset something like multi-factor authentication. Today, you might call the help desk because that's sort of the only way to kind of get back into your account. Uh, and we've created a way to automate that so that a user can, in a self-service way, go type in their email they're trying to unlock, go through a secure identity verification flow, and then unlock their account with, you know, Okta, Duo, Microsoft, uh, whatever uh, platform they might be using. Does taking the you know, sort of the customer service person out of the equation potentially help reduce the risk of fraud? Because I feel like so much of fraud comes down to, like, human error, essentially, or, or you know, social engineering, manipulating somebody to do something that they, you know, to their best intentions, they don't mean to do. We find it's actually a really good cost savings tool, frankly. You know, one of the, if you think of what most companies spend their help desk tickets on, up to half of them are actually related to lockouts and identity verification requests right. of sorts. So one of the best ways is to say, hey, let's increase the security. By the way, remove the frustration that a user might go through thinking, oh, no, I have to go call a help desk and talk to a human. But there's a huge cost savings benefit. The flip side is also the fact that you can increase security, but we try and give those reps also a tool they can use. So if you do call the help desk, the rep has a better way than, let's say, security questions uh, of trying to verify who you are. And so that's one way to make it secure, regardless of whether it's self-service or kind of agent assisted. Okay, so more secure plus more efficient. Sounds like uh, great. <laughs> I will take that. Awesome. So I want to get into the topic. Like, I, I feel like, you know, I go to a lot of conferences. I talk to a ton of people. I don't think anything strikes fear into, you know, both technical and non-technical people more than the idea of like deep fakes. Like there's just something deeply unsettling about someone being able to make it look like you or, or you know, maybe someone you know doing something terrible when it didn't actually happen. So like, just to kind of take a step back at the, and look at sort of the landscape of deep fakes, like what is sort of the history of that problem? You know, where did it start and when, when did this start becoming like something to be concerned about? Yeah, as we've seen this rise of kind of generative AI and more advanced tools that, that can make AI generated content of all sorts, kind of the coinciding risk has been this concept of deep fakes. And so it is kind of in some ways the dark side of AI, right? It's the thing that we don't want AI to you to do, yet it's sort of the part that criminals and bad actors are able to take advantage of kind of most easily. Because traditionally the tools and systems we have to kind of know who someone is aren't yet as advanced as what the bad actors are able to use pretending to be someone else. So deepfakes are relatively new technology called 2017, 2018, kind of the coin, the term was sort of even coined around then. Uh, and this concept of being able to use modern tools basically to present the identity of being someone else other than who you might might actually be. Yeah, I read that I think like deep fake attacks are 3000% in 2023. So but, I mean, <laughs> so clearly this is like a fairly recent thing and, and probably a part of that escalation has also been the advancements that we've made in the world of generative AI in the last couple of years with you know, LLMs, Dolly, and also, you know, now you're seeing things from OpenAI with Sora, plus other technologies that are specifically developed for essentially faking or, or you know, mimicking uh, a real individual that isn't that person. That's right. And it presents really significant challenges for society because to your, your point, there's sort of some of it's the real actual uh, gosh, deep fake attacks are on the rise. People are seeing them come up in increasing numbers and depending on the industry and the type of work then the, they're getting quite significant in terms of how often those attacks are occurring. But even more so, it's it's kind of the fear. And it's the fact that you necessarily can't trust knowing who someone is or who the human is behind the screen. You know, there's, there's one account that's gotten pretty popular, um, at least in terms of the world of fear and kind of raising everyone's awareness. It was just a couple months ago where there was a kind of multinational corporation, the quote CFO, person pretending to be the CFO was in London. The controller, the finance controller in the company was based in Hong Kong. And the controller got an email and said, oh, hi, you know, I'm the CFO. I need to do a few wire transfers for me. 
the controller was rightly a little bit suspicious. And so the pretending to be CFO said, oh, you know what? A bunch of us are already on a video call. We'll send you a link. Why don't you join? And then you can get the approvals you need. Sounds plausible. Sounds like a high trust scenario for how we operate today. So the controller jumped on the line and it turned out that he recognized the, the many faces on that call. There were people that they, you know, they had seen before and voices they'd heard, execs they knew existed in the company, but they were deep fake emulators. And there were people pretending to be those other executives in the company. Obviously, the controller felt comfortable. So great. I kind of had the approvals I need. And, you know, $25 million was transferred. And so it brought to light, wow, gosh, we all hop in these video calls every day. We think we're interacting with sort of our colleagues or new relationship, personal, professional, let alone this is sort of considered to be the gold standard for how to verify someone at those high risk moments. It's meant to be, you know, let's get on a video call. Let me see the person move around. Maybe let me ask them to hold up something or hold up an ID or say or answer certain things. And suddenly, if we can't trust that interaction, it, it goes to sort of this core of, of how we as humans assess, is someone else human, you know, and are the person that we think um, we think they are. And so situations like that have really raised awareness and made people fear, gosh, this technology is getting really good. Fast forward this just a little bit, let alone the present day. How can I really trust that the person I know is the one behind the screen? Yeah, absolutely. And this is the point of the interview where you, you know, pull back the, the mask and reveal that you're not actually, you know, Aaron Painter and who you, who you say you are. But, you know, besides that, you know, what are some of the other sort of famous examples where people have used deep fakes to gain access to a system or maybe manipulate people for some reason? Well, we're seeing them used a lot in, in mixed cases where somebody might use elements of deep fakes uh, or really even elements of impersonation kind of more broadly. You know, if you if you under if you unpack the systems of how we trust today, multi-factor authentication has kind of become the layer on top of the password, and that really started as sort of SMS, right? Let me send you a text message to make sure that you are accessible at the phone number we think we have in file for you. Therefore, you must be the right person. Obviously, we you know today there's that's probably one of the weakest methods, but that's been kind of the, the standard for many years. And one of the challenges there is that you're just sort of shifting the burden of I forgot my password basically from the, the entity you're trying to get into to basically the mobile operators or the telcos. Because all you have to do is call the telco and say, hi, you know, I got a new phone here. I upgraded my hardware. Can you move my phone number over from the old phone to the new phone? And that, that telco operator, that well-intending customer support rep also has this challenge of saying, who is this person? Are they the one who really holds the account? And they have limited tools to do it. And if they get it wrong, someone does what's called a SIM swap, where they take over that phone number. And then anything that's linked to SMS and two-factor authentication that way is going to send the, the, the verification the text to the wrong phone number or to someone who has control of that phone number. And so what we've seen is an increasing number of attacks where it might even start with something as simple as that, taking over a phone number, then maybe doing some research on LinkedIn, looking at you know data that's been leaked and exposed about you, uh, piecing those things together to then be able to say, sure, I can answer security questions. I can tell you the, the, you know, the pin code that was sent to me via SMS and use techniques like that kind of components to, to earn someone's trust to sort of social engineer their way into an account. Yeah, I, I know of, um, like you mentioned there, the idea that it, sometimes it's, it's not like you're necessarily using deface the whole holistically across this, like a, a, a tool in your tool belt to, uh, uh, you know, pull off an attack. Like uh, last year, there was this attack on retool where def the deface component of that was someone was synthesizing their voice to sound like an employee over the phone call to the customer support, support rep. And then additionally, they knew some other details in terms of like retools, office layout and, and all this sort of stuff. But there was a lot of components that went into it. But to make it kind of the extra layer of uh, not only sophistication, but like ability to get people to trust you, then you kind of layer in that the, the deep fake piece where it looks like the person that you would expect it to look like or sounds like the person that you would expect it to sound like. That's exactly right. You know what? I think one of the other most common cases have been sort of this notion of using the social engineering techniques, which can couple with using deep, deep fake tools, using a voice emulator if that's part of someone's you know traditional verification process. Maybe it's SIM swap, and maybe you've used some elements of deep fakes or impersonation to take over someone's phone number, let's say at the telco layer. Uh, you know, one of the most visible started really last August with MGM. And unfortunately, it, it's gotten a lot of additional attention. There was a great kind of Wall Street Journal investigative report. It's gotten so mainstream. I don't know if you caught this, but there was a recent 60-minute segment on the MGM attack. 
just because it's it's such a um, relevant topic today. And, you know, what happened there is um, a bad actor was able to do some of this research we're talking about. They were able to, in some cases, the variations of the attack, but, you know, take control of the phone number, answer certain security questions. Turns out in that particular attack, they might have even gotten some of the security questions wrong. But basically, they called the help desk and they said, hi, I am an MGM employee, a particular employee, and um, I'm locked out of my account and I need to get back in. And the help desk rep, you know, followed the playbook and said, okay, great. I need to ask you a few questions. Well, can I send you a text message? You know, they had a variety of internal protocols. And it uh, turns out they, they social engineered their way into taking over that account. The help desk rep reset the account. The bad actor went in. And then, you know, ransomware ensued and a whole bunch of other things that, you know, caused meaningful business impact to MGM. And what's sort of been so profound in that is, one, it, people felt it, right? Because when you were going to check into your hotels in, in Vegas, suddenly, you know, the, this enterprise that was very physical and real was offline. And people knew that something bad had happened and, it, you know, MGM disclosed it. But what's even worse is that that's only continued. And so what made some of these stories so compelling is that it's a really... In some cases, a talented group at this point that is going out after hundreds and hundreds of big companies right now in basically an epidemic fashion of doing the same playbook over and over. Hi, help desk. It's me. I'm locked out. Either the customer account. If they can't penetrate the customer account, they go to a high value employee account, deposit ransomware, leads to data breaches, et cetera. And so it's, it's just becoming this sort of cyber attack of the moment are using these techniques in, frankly, not very sophisticated ways, but to significant means. Are there specific tools that attackers are using in order to um, you know, generate things that are specific for deep faking? Or are they leveraging sort of like the, the common tools that we might be using for other tasks that are like a legitimate use case? That's a great question. You know, you're able to use kind of commercially available tools often in creating deep fakes, but how you deploy them uh, comes down to a couple of common methods. And it gets a little bit technical, but it's good to sort of conceptually understand. The first um, is often what's called an injection attack. And the best way I can describe an injection attack is, is almost when you're using, let's say, Teams or Zoom and you have the ability to select your camera feed. Well, that was meant to be a convenience factor. You might have a different microphone or camera that you want to use for that call. Great. Those systems weren't designed to prevent against injection attacks. That is basically changing the source of the feed to be something else, like a deep fake emulator piece of software or um, some manipulated lines of code in a more malicious way. And so one of the most common things to do is you say, I'm going to inject uh, a, a different camera feed. So let's say, or I'm going to inject something that makes it seem like, uh, you know, the PDF that I've been able to manipulate using a generative AI tool. Uh, you know, here's a photo of me, make me a California driver's license, save his PDF. Many tools have an upload the PDF button. Others might have a more malicious way you can inject that manipulated PDF into the flow. So injection is sort of one of these key ways that, that um, people deploy deep fakes. The other one is what's called a presentation attack. And presentation attacks are literally when you, you might think you're wearing a mask or you have physically manipulated, let's say, your government ID or the photo that you're holding or the video that you're going to hold up to a camera. And you were literally presenting to whatever the inspector is, let's call it a, you know, another camera of sorts, to say, hey, look at this. What I'm showing you has actually been modified. Uh, you might not claim that it's modified, but it is, in fact, has been modified. And so it's coupled together, those two are the main way, an injection attack where you inject a different sort of feed or a presentation attack where you present falsified information or documentation become the leading ways that people use or deploy uh, deep fakes. Mm -hmm. And then like, how effective are current like technologies and methods for actually distinguishing between what's real and, and what's deep faked? Yeah, there are a bunch of companies out there that do uh, sort of deep fake detection. And basically, the fundamental approach um, is, is an arms race. It's can AI detect AI, right? It's we are using tools and we're writing AI models that can try and detect if someone is using something that's been falsified or manipulated. They're really structured often around those presenta presentation attacks. Uh, you know, is someone presenting a falsified image or video feed or video? Great. Well, uh, my AI can detect that and therefore it classifies itself as in, you know, a, a deep fake detector. That's the majority of the category of the technology out there is trying to do that. In the world of content creation, there's a slightly other approach that's gaining ground, which, you know, a lot of the big tech companies have put weight behind, which is sort of watermarking or the concept of, you know, I've created this piece of content. Maybe I have intentionally created a deep fake for good reasons. And uh, I'm going to watermark the fact that this was created using some deep fake creation technology. 
Um, there's, there's a lot of logic in that. The challenge is that if you're a bad actor, you're going to go and use a tool that doesn't watermark, right? You're going to try and use a creation tool that doesn't have the watermark functionality uh, to sort of a, avoid that or evade it. So uh, those are typically the ways that, um, that deepfakes are created today. Mm -hmm. or what, what are the good reasons for generating something that's uh, intentionally deepfaked? Uh, I often think of entertainment. You might think of the creative space. You might think of advertising. You know, the ability to, I just saw an ad for, you know, a, a vet contract vendor who, who we, we hire. Um, and they took the person and they put the person in the middle of Times Square. And it looked like they had probably done some really expensive, fancy photo shoot. And, uh, you know, instead they took a great photo of an individual and used a, a deep fake creation tool to put that person in a great background in space and with wonderful lighting. Um, the, the ability to create high profile advertising pieces, the ability to create uh, literally creative works, be them audio, be them video or things um, is awesome. I mean, that's one of the really fun ways you mentioned Dali, uh, of course, you know, Sora and other platforms. It's advancing in a significant way that can be really fun and meaningful and in the creative industries. But when it comes to preventing fraud, when it comes to protecting accounts and substituting things uh, where where kind of money is on the line often, or the value of that account is meaningful to you, um, it obviously has a different benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, you know, going back to preventing these kinds of attacks or what, like current technologies, like how, when it comes to like facial recognition, um, you know, a lot of phones are unlocked through facial recognition. Like how sophisticated does the attack need to be to actually break those systems? Like, are they pretty good at detecting that this is actually like, a person that's like moving their face in front of the device versus like a, a still image or a video feed that's being you know, essentially projected onto the device from somewhere else? Yeah, it's it's a thoughtful question. Face ID in particular on the iPhones is, is a unique set of technologies because it, uh, it, it has the ability to do 3D detection, right? And so it is basically an advanced camera that's able to look at the three-dimensional you know, Z-axis of a person to know is, are they there? And so... You've, you've by default already cut down a lot of forms of I held up this photo, I've held up this video in an advanced way. Now you still get into, however, what if someone's wearing a mask and you know a three D, they're three D human wearing a three D mask? They're, they're more advanced scenarios. Um, but for the most part, uh, the face ID cameras is a strong and effective way, at least to say, is this the same face we've seen before? Now, if you zoom in on problems with iPhones, however, more broadly, you know, there was this sort of Wall Street article from about a year and a half ago where I think it was a dad in Florida and, you know, he was locked out of his iCloud account and had all the photos of his kids. And, you know, he offered $10,000 to Apple. He offered to fly to Cupertino to prove his identity. And he said, look, I, I use Face ID. You know who I am. Can't you just unlock my account? And they said, well, no, we we know it's the same face that uses the phone all the time, but we don't know whose face that is that isn't linked to, you know, a government issued ID or something else. And so that person was locked out of their iCloud account while they're able to use face ID to access their phone. And so there's a, a distinction there often in, in the limits of sort of what face ID was designed to do. More broadly, though, it, it is often this arms race. You know, again, if you zoom into the presentation attacks for injection attacks, most often it's particularly webcams, if you think about it, it is difficult to detect, am I holding up a, a real photo or is this me? And then those are literally AI models that do that. And I, I would argue they're insufficient. Today, it is literally an arms race. One company might claim they're slightly better and they slightly figure this out. And then the bad actors are going to figure out something more tomorrow. And you hope you know that and catch it before the you know you update your good model. It's a back and forth arms race to say, can AI detect AI? And frankly, I don't think that's winnable. So what are the strategies? I mean, the... If you look at, and we mentioned this earlier, things like data breaches, these attacks, like a lot of times it's a human that is generally the weak link. And you could have incredible security. I'm sure MGM's security is with, you know, top notch. I'm sure they, you know, meet all the, the highest bar of security and compliance and so forth, but they were still penetrated by these types of attacks. So, and, and it's hard to stop someone from picking up a thumb drive that they find on the ground in the dr driveway of their building and then plug it in their computer that leads to some sort of compromise. And then you throw in the possibility that you could be receiving a phone call that sounds like your CEO asking you for access to something, then it becomes really, really challenging to actually prevent these attacks. So like, what can you do to essentially safeguard against this? 
Yeah, I'd say one of the things that has shaped a lot of what we've tried to create in, in our product line is this concept of, of using more tools than just AI to defeat AI. And for us, that includes using all the toys uh, and advanced features and functions basically in a modern mobile phone. So if you think about this process of kind of verifying who a person is, we it's been around for quite a while. I mean, you think about opening a new bank account, maybe you've done that virtually, and it's, okay, great, in order to bank, open the account, we need to go through a know your customer or a KYC flow, uh, which is often take a photo of your ID, take a selfie. The IRS has flavors of this now. Um, and you do those steps and the great, it's sort of great. It passes, things match, you're good to go. But the challenge is that those were created for regulatory compliance. They really weren't created or invented to stop fraud and certainly not to stop things like deep fakes. So as we were saying earlier, often there's even an upload a PDF button, let alone if someone were to more maliciously inject, you know, a, 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 some, a doctored image that they made. And so what we do is we route it instead of using web browsers, like 100 percent of the market for scan your ID and take a selfie. We take the same end user experience, but we route it to a mobile phone. And by doing it on a mobile phone, we're able to take advantage of the cryptography of modern phones and basically the walled gardens that Apple and Android create for us to know, for example, that injection attacks can't happen, that you are using the camera on the phone, let's say, to scan your ID and take it a selfie. Therefore, you are not injecting a manipulated file or image that you might be doing. We're able to use things like the 3D depth map to, for face ID to say, is this person human? You know, are they in a three dimensional space? So we're able to use all these advanced features in addition to AI models to try and defeat AI. And we just feel that what these, these phones that we carry in our pockets have so much technology that actually can be a, a, on our side, a unique arsenal in sort of protecting humans against deep fake presentations and other things. Yeah, I mean, if you look at how sophisticated something like Apple Pay works directly from your device, like they're like Apple's probably the only company in the world that does credit card transactions without actually storing your credit card like on a server somewhere. It's stored in an enclave on your phone and never leaves your phone. And it's really just a essentially a, a token that gets shared to with the, the payment service providers. So it's a very sophisticated way of protecting something like your your credit card. And there's to your point, there's a lot we can take advantage with how sophisticated these devices are. So can you kind of like walk me through how that works? Like I I can't get access to my account. Um I am using uh, name tag or my you know, providers using name tag to uh, essentially help me get access to my account. What what sort of happens from a consumer perspective? Yeah, I think one of the best examples might be, uh, let's say you use HubSpot, maybe as your CRM platform or your market automation platform. Uh, HubSpot's been really uh, progressive in prioritizing security. And they would say things like, uh, hey, you should have MFA on your account as a customer, right? And so you turn on MFA, you've done the right thing. And then let's say for whatever reason, you get locked out of MFA. You've upgraded your phone, it doesn't work, something goes wrong. Um, you go to HubSpot and you click, you know, I'm locked out of my account. And it gives you an option and says, sorry to hear this. You have two options. You can contact support. It takes 48 to 72 hours and we'll help you figure this out, literally. Or you can click here and use name tag and we'll have you right back in. So you click, I'm going to use name tag. It prompts you then if you're, let's say, on desktop to scan a QR code. If you're on mobile, you would just tap the button. And then what launches is sort of this name tag verification flow for HubSpot that um, asks you for your ID and asks you for a selfie. It's quick, takes less than 30 seconds. You do the two of them. You give your consent to share back with HubSpot. HubSpot receives that information and they uh, unlock your account and allow you to reset your MFA. So it's a full self-service automated way to do previously what almost everyone else has to do, which is contact the help desk or ask for support. Yeah, so you're combining essentially the, the, the features of the phone to detect that this was like a, a real person, the 3D mapping. I'm, you know, doing my, my my selfie or my image through the camera, but you're also making sure that it's not just, um, you know, me doing that, and you're verifying that, it, you know, it's that's that's you know my face, but actually tying my face to a government issued ID to do this sort of ID verification as well, because presumably for me to have a, I'm assuming like a driver's license or something like that, I've had to do a fair amount of work with the, you know. California state government for, for me anyway, in order to, to get that driver's license, they know that it's actually me. That's it's spot on. And we can then say, hey, is this, are you the person in front of this ID? And is this ID valid? Uh, and has it been manipulated? Was it presented in the right way? Then we know that those two things can match up. And then we can say you are the owner of this HubSpot account and go ahead and unlock that HubSpot account. And so they've been really advanced in creating this awesome customer experience that frankly also has made sort of security a differentiator. 
right? If you use HubSpot, you have account takeover protection now built in to your account. That's a, it's a meaningful thing because in today's world, this is the number one way that people are taking over accounts with other providers is they've turned on MFA and then someone calls the help desk, pretends to be you and takes over your account. And so HubSpot's been thoughtful in putting in kind of an alternative solution there that um, has not only improved their security, but it significantly changed the customer experience and their cost structure behind providing support. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and HubSpot, like if you're using it as your CRM or even as your marketing automation platform, it's holding a lot of valuable information about your your customer base. So that's that's a high value asset for someone to try to take to take over and exploit. That's right. In terms of the IDs, like what kind of IDs do you support and how easy is it for me to like fake one of those IDs? We support a really broad range, uh, 10,000 plus document types around the world. Um, we learned quickly that so many of our customers had employees and customers all around the world. And so they needed global coverage for that. Great. When you get into then, how do you, uh, you know, could you manipulate your ID type? You get into the same types of things you would see with deep fakes, coincidentally. You know, are you going to inject or are you going to present? And if you are going to inject, um, by using mobile phones, we are able to stop injection. And so that means if you went to the GPT equivalent and said, here's my photo, make me a California driver's license with this name on it, save as PDF, and you put that through your standard, you know, know your customer tool, there's literally the upload button, or you would forcibly say, hey, no, look at this feed, look at this PDF I created. Um, using our, our approach with, with name tag, you, we, we, we were a defense against injection attacks. So therefore, you're not going to be able to use that PDF you just created. Right. So then we get to zoom in and say, all right, have you physically manipulated this, this document type? And that becomes a whole different bar. And then we also are able to use, again, all these advanced you know, telemetry and, and insights from the mobile phone to say, all right, let's assess the caliber of what you're presenting to make sure that it's legit. Yeah, like it's, it's very low cost for me to digitally fake a driver's license versus produce a physical artifact. So then already you're you're making it, uh, you know, there's uh, any attacks that the attacker is going to be doing some sort of ROI calculation on this. I mean, the reason why email spam is still a thing 30 years <laughs> later uh, after, like, I think probably the uh, original email spam was, was starting to send is because it's very inexpensive to send an email to somebody. But if it actually was more expensive or more time consuming, it would significantly cut down on the spam attacks because, it's just that's such a volume uh, game. And it's similar here where if it's more costly in terms of time and also expense, then automatically you, you cut down the number of people who are willing to go through the pain of attacking, uh, doing the attack. You're spot on. You're thinking exactly like a security professional. And, you know, that's what we have a lot of those folks in our team who have built their whole career on that. And exactly early on in particular in our development processes, that was totally the goal. It was how do you make it harder and harder and harder for an adversary to try and find a way in. And you do that while you're doing it for national security and nation state attacks as much as in protecting commercial assets. And that's very much our structure. In fact, we colloquially call it more of a Swiss cheese approach where it's like, great, let's harder and harder and harder. And if you help pop in default wall, get through one hole, there's another wall. It just sort of stops, you know? And so we're um, able to deeply engage an adversary to make it difficult for them to kind of find their way through and ultimately to take over an account. Are you able to take into other factors on the phone, like the geolocation of the person so that, you know, if I'm, if, if, if I, I don't know, I have a California driver's license, the presumably the, probably the account that I signed up for knows like approximately where I live, but then my geolocation suddenly in another country, are you kind of able to take signals in like that to, to determine like what the fraud risk factor is? We do. And it depends a little bit on the scenario and kind of what the company needs for the transaction that they're trying to, to authorize or to, to verify in this case. Um, but some other topics that really come into play are the ones that I know you spend a lot of time thinking about, too, around privacy, around consent, uh, around, uh, frankly, inclusion even. You know, what do you do, for example, if you've cre if uh, someone has been through the flow and then goes through and uh, might have a gender change or change their name or, you know, we, they, they leave the country and they come back and they have a new ID and a new state and a new. How do you still help make sure that that person can be verified also as being them? And so um, those are all kind of factors we have to think about. And how do you balance fraud and how do you also make sure the user experience respects the personal changes a person might go through, um, can deeply respect their privacy so that they are the holders of their information. It's their 
PII, right? They are choosing to consent. They are opting into sharing. How do you protect the company on the other side so that they are very much in the spirit of Skyflow, you know, not taking on additional PII risk uh, and having information they might not otherwise want? Um, all sort of considerations we have to think about when you go through this flow of sort of verifying who a person is. Yeah. How do you go about actually, like if I'm scanning my ID, uh, how do you actually go about protecting the, the image scan of that? We, we think of it as privacy masking, and we operate in both ways, both for the end user and for the company. And so the end user has to say, just because you've scanned your ID, you have this clear screen that says, okay, the company is actually only asking for certain elements of your ID. Maybe it's your name, maybe it's your birth date, maybe it's um, the fact that you're of a certain age, you know, in certain use cases, am I over 18, am I over 21? And so you're consenting to share those specific attributes with the company. And then the company, by the way, might only be storing those attributes, or frankly, even storing none at all in their spirit of verifying who you are. And so maybe they only want to know, am I speaking to a, a human who is over the age of 21? Great, right? That might be all sufficient without actually I need to know which human, certainly not knowing their name or their face. Um, and frankly, in no case is it help me understand the biometric identifier or things like that. Uh, we, we don't hold those. We we um, none of our processors do, but it's those elements of being very intentional and opt in on consent for what you are sharing with the company, so that um, you feel like you have control over your data. And it, what what are some of the technologies that you had to develop in the process of building name tag? Well, we think about um, MFA today, multi factor authentication, and kind of its limitations. And we you know one of its biggest was I have an authenticator app. Let's say I move beyond the world of the SMS verification, and I have this app, but then my device changes, right? Again, for whatever reason, I upgraded it, it moved, I had to restart, reset, a whole bunch of things happen. And suddenly you don't have access anymore to that authenticator app. And that actually creates this problem of lockouts. That creates the problem of recovery. And so, you know, a core piece of technology we developed and you know, since patented is this concept of, well, can I recover it? Can I say, I have a new phone, I want to recover my authenticator app or recover access to my account? And one of the ways we solve that is by asking you for your government ID and your selfie. If you happen to be on the same device the second time you go to interact with that same company, you can only use your selfie, for example. Perhaps you don't need to scan your ID again, sort of an express re-verification element we offer. But if you are a new device, we just say, hey, we don't recognize you. Time to scan your ID and selfie again. Ah, okay, now we're able to recognize you and resume trust of that device and kind of resume your account. And so this concept of solving for what happens when someone loses that device token or the trust that was established with the given device um, was a really one of kind of many very fundamental technologies we had to solve for. How much of the actual, uh, like putting the pieces to together to determine whether the person is trying to fraud the system or not occurs on the phone versus the server? Is, is the phone mostly just for capture and then it's going to the server where it's going to do the, the compute function to determine whether this is really the person or not? Or is some of that aspect actually done directly on the device? It's a mix, uh, you know, but able to use what essentially is a native experience on the phone, you're able to take advantage of a lot of things. This was a big user experience breakthrough we had where in order to take advantage of a lot of these, these advanced toys on the phone, we, we had to first have people download a native app. The challenge that is if the friction of going to the app store and downloading the app. And so we're able to use this thing called an app clip on iOS and an instant app on Android, which is kind of little known. They, maybe you've used them if you've been to a restaurant and they have, you know, Toast is a platform that allows you to pay and kind of order. Uh, Toast uses them. Some like parking lots use them. I mean, it's, it's a very, very low, high value scenario usage, so to speak. Um, we use them heavily. And basically, when you get prompted for that, that ID verification flow, we have a downloaded over the air an app clip, which is something we register with Apple. It's fully a part of Apple's secure walled garden. But it is a user experience where you don't need to go to the app store to download it. It just sort of appears temporarily. It gives you all the security functions and lets us do this, sort of this thoughtful evaluation we're doing and making sure you're you, but without the friction of having to go to the app store. And by the way, when you're done, it just kind of goes away. And so you don't have, you're not left with the legacy of I've added another app to my home screen. And so that, that was a really big breakthrough in using that technology. And then frankly, having to invent a bunch of things around it to make that work well. Um, that sort of allowed this this kind of innovation to happen. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I actually wasn't familiar with it. I have used some of those apps that you mentioned, which probably were, do work that way, but I just didn't even recognize it or notice it. 
It's a neat feature. It's limiting a little bit because your, your app has to be small. Um, but actually, back to your question, one of the neat things is um, our app is small because we take advantage of so many things on the mobile platform, on device, you know, on device AI, on device image processing. Um, we do things in the cloud at the same time. But, you know, it's almost like when you're depositing a check, if you've ever done that for your bank, you know, and it sort of says, OK, this is too bright, you know, turn to the left, turn to the right. Take that for granted, but that actually can be done with on-device image processing to give the user sort of real-time feedback or to help make sure you're capturing, let's say, a non-blurry image. And so by using a lot of the native phone functionality, we can just deliver a great experience um, with, without the, the friction around it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I always find it fascinating. There's you know a number of companies, that I, even outside of the space that I've seen, do this effectively where they really leverage the, the person's device because... You know, we kind of forget that we're carrying around like a, a very powerful computer in our pocket all the time. Uh, and, you know, not everything has to essentially go to a server somewhere for compute. You can have a tremendous amount of compute power directly on your device and you can actually get a much better user experience sometimes by taking advantage of the compute power locally on the device versus having to deal with the, the data transfer, um, potential data transfer limitations. I think you're spot on. And back to our core topic on deep fakes, I actually think that's one of the critical ingredients when we think about how to prevent deep fakes is it's got to be more than just using cloud processing power, which is essentially AI, right? Cloud, cloud assembled the right way and processed the right way against AI. That will be a limited, that it will be an arms race. And so the concept of using other human tools we have, like the native processing power in those mobile phones, the fact that we're holding the mobile phone, the fact that we're using those funk of it, uh, we're using them for so much today and there's so much telemetry we can capture from how we use them, how we move as humans, how the device moves. Like there's functionality there combined with the power of the cloud that I feel like can be effectively used to defeat or prevent things like deep fakes from becoming a part of our lives in the areas where we don't want them. Yeah, absolutely. And very well said. As an individual, what are things that you know myself or listeners can potentially do to help protect identity theft? I think there are a bunch of things. At the very limited, you need to turn on uh, multi-factor authentication. So any uh, you know account you have as a customer, or you know certainly in your business environment, if if, if it's enabled to do that, you should do it. Uh, turning on multi-factor authentication is a critical first step. But the next thing I like to ask often is, what happens when I'm locked out? <laughs> And how is how have you as a com as a company that I'm working with prepared for that? Because if the process when you're locked out is simply oh don't worry we turn off MFA, then it's kind of theatrics and you've kind of wasted my time each time I'm logging in anyway. If all I have to do is say I'm locked out and turn it off, and so that that's a critical element that I like to think through when I'm making kind of purchasing decisions. When I think about myself though as a company and you know, IT business leaders that we talk to. One of the most practical things we think about is to run a penetration test of your environment. Run a penetration test of your customer support organization or your internal IT help desk. You know, what happens if a caller, you know, reaches out to your support team and pretends that they are locked out of their customer account? How do your teams respond? How are they trained to ask? Uh, how do they go about verifying someone's identity? And is that a process that you'd be proud of or one that you feel would help keep user accounts safe? Then do the same thing with your internal IT organization. And understanding those flows can lead not only to better training and content, but it might lead you to make certain decisions around how you're going about protecting infrastructure and protecting accounts that, like any penetration test, you might otherwise not have seen. Yeah, and I think with lockouts in particular, like, you know, we talked about the costs from a customer support perspective, but there's a huge, like, number of other costs involved with that as well. Because if I'm locked out and I'm super frustrated, like I might just not use the product and you potentially you're losing out on revenue, like go somewhere else essentially. Or another scenario could be, well, I go and try to create like another account and sort of like it's faster for me to create a new account because people optimize for signups. They don't necessarily optimize for recovery of a locked out account. So the signup process is faster. And then you're creating essentially duplicate accounts that later lead to probably some sort of consolidation um, request or something. And then that pushes downstream costs to the customer support team and so forth. So it's a, it's a massive, massive problem uh, if you don't like, you know, do, deal with it and design it properly. I, I know you, you're marketing background heavily, and so I'm sure these are the kind of things you think about a lot too. And they are very real. And you dissect that flow. You know, imagine a user going to sign up on, a, on an email form even, and they put in a fake email address. Okay, well then that fake email address is gonna propagate into your system. You had some value associated with probably getting the lead. That lead is not a real person. Maybe it's not even, not the right person, might not be a real person. 
Great. Then you're going to now send emails out to that person that you think is real. They're going to bounce. So then you're going to have a bounce rate that's going to affect your deliverability. That like, this this whole cycle of costs, and that's not even a high security interaction, right? That's maybe signing up for a newsletter. And so this this concept that we're able to be someone else or sort of be fraudulent in today's world um, using deep fakes or even just using other things that obscure our identity because we're so bad at knowing who the real person is behind a screen. It, it does lead to costs that are hidden and frankly, that are just very out there and straightforward. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, looking into the future, how, how do you see the battle of against deep fakes kind of evolving? Do you think that, you know, that your approach by combining using the device, combining it with things in the cloud as well, is, is going to have a meaningful, you know, positive impact? Or do you think that it's going to continue to also be an arms race where you'll need to continue to evolve name tag to, to, to keep up with the sophistication of the attacks? I, I think there are always ways to continue to improve and get better. And we spend a lot of time on that. I, I would say today that I, I, I'm not bullish on AI against AI. I think that is going to be an arms race. And a lot of providers I see that are doing, call it deep fake detection, are in that arms race. And you know what? They might have a slight advantage and it might last for a while. It might not. I don't know. I don't want to be in that arms race. You know, we architecturally have a very different approach in using cryptography and biometrics and other things in addition to AI to defeat AI. And that's a bet I'd much rather make. The other broad concept, though, I think a lot about is in this world of, of content creation and, you know, call it even social media or submitting content and knowing who, who authentically is behind that. And I, I fundamentally believe that safe communities know their members. You know, it's a lot like when you, let's say you go to an event and you check in at the front desk and they might ask you for your business card. They might ask you for your government ID. Coincidentally, they might give you a name tag that you would wear around, let's say, at the event. But people you meet then know, oh, I can trust you. Oh, I know Sean. I know Sean works here. It's guy. Oh, great. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. Those are, those are powerful interactions. But the event host has done something to create a safe space. When you go to the airport, you know, someone looks at your boarding pass. They ask you for ID. They put you through a metal detector. You are in a safe space. But today, often in the world of social media in particular, we don't necessarily know, the, the platform doesn't necessarily know who that user is. And it's okay to operate by a pseudonym or have an alias or other things, but I would argue that the platform has a responsibility to know authentically who the user is. And unfortunately, many platforms today haven't taken that on that level of responsibility. And if you misbehave or something goes wrong, you simply leave and you come back with a new email address and you create a new account. And sure enough, you might be real, you might be a bot, who knows, but you know, havoc ensues. And I, I think we're at a real inflection point in society where we need to authentically know who the humans are behind the screens in trusted spaces and in safe communities. Yeah, I feel like the kind of AI versus AI for trying to address this problem it feels a little bit like the late 90s or mid 90s to like the early aughts with antivirus software, where it was just this like continual arms race against people writing viruses and then the antivirus t companies like scrambling to update their service to address the new virus and then a new version of that would come out. And it's just like, it's a never ending battle. Like you, you can't, as a consumer, you're constantly just like updating this thing to, to get the latest, but you're, you're never ever going to stay ahead of, of the attackers. It, it's just an impossible uh, race to win. And it's like a great analogy. And there's probably some, you know, some of my colleagues could probably give you very detailed views, kind of why they roll their eyes often when they think about antivirus tools. But you're right, there were so many advances that were created architecturally to sort of solve that. The way code runs, the way things are op operate in browsers, and to isolate some of those threats so they couldn't just run rampant unless you, the user, did something or you know plugged in that USB drive or clicked on that link. And even then, now there are smart architectural things to help prevent against some of that. Um, certainly, it still exists as a problem, but we've been able to use technology to solve that in ways that were uh, more advanced, that were architecturally different. To your point, and I would argue yeah. we're at exactly the same point now. Yeah, I think it's the difference between taking like a first principles approach to trying to solve solve this problem fundamentally versus putting like a band aid on a broken limb and hoping that the limb fixes itself. Right? Like you're you're just never going to solve off the fundamental problem by uh, attaching a point solution to it. It's spot on. Very insightful. Uh, well, as we start to wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share? You know, what's sort of next for for NameTag and some of the stuff that you're doing over there? We're very focused on this huge problem, um, particularly today. If you use MFA in your daily life or as an employee or, you know, your company that's rolled it out for your customer accounts, there is an issue with lockouts. 
It's a real present expensive and frankly, a security risk danger. Uh, and so our market today is how do we help surround those, surround the existing MFA implementations you have to automate them, to give your users sort of a self-service way to securely reset MFA when they get locked out. We focus a lot on that, how to integrate more with other MFA providers, how do we continue to think about uh, making it even easier for users in certain countries where there are national identity platforms that are emerging that can give us some security level uh, of confidence beyond you know physical document types. Uh, Things like that are kind of really fun and keep us on our toes, but it's it's very gratifying to know that we're helping to create sort of a safer space, like helping to protect people in the digital world. Uh, I certainly couldn't do it in the physical world. I'm not capable to be a, an armed guard or to help keep someone safe physically, um, but I love that our team can help do it digitally. And we find a lot of uh, you know satisfaction in knowing that we can help people keep their accounts safe. Yeah, I mean, I think when you work in areas like security, privacy, I'm sure other, you know, if you're working in, in uh, you know, healthcare, life sciences and stuff like that, there's, it's easy to feel passionate about, about it because you, at the end of the day, you're helping somebody in some way, either protecting them or maybe making something that's going to like meaningfully help them uh, in, in their life. And, you know, I spent a number of years at Google and, um, you know, and I enjoyed the experience, but I had to, you know, uh, squint a little bit to make the sort of, you know, passion driven argument for how I was necessarily positively impacting people. So it's nice to be, I, I totally agree. It's nice to be in a space where you can feel really good about the product that you're putting out there because you strongly believe that it's going to, you know, move companies or, or people in a direction that's going to help the world. Well, meeting some of your colleagues over the years too, I know that a lot of them kind of feel that passion and that sense of mission in what you're doing. So it's, it's wonderful to talk through it with you today. Awesome. Well, Aaron, thanks so much for being here. I really enjoyed it. I thought this was a, a great topic of, uh, uh, to discuss and thanks. Uh, we'll have to have you back down the road uh, and uh, cheers. I love that. Thanks for having me.